Good morning, everyone. Let me pass out the lessons. We're, at, we're on lesson six, and um, if all goes well, we'll be finishing chapter four. That'll leave two chapters, so <laughs> six or eight, eight, eight more weeks, right, for two chapters. This lesson's a little shorter. I didn't want to really, I didn't really want to delve into chapter five a whole lot. Um, and then I'll just leave a couple lessons strewn about for those who may show up a bit later. Okay. So we're making our way through Galatians and I guess as a summary, what's the main problem? Can somebody just kind of give a, give a 10 second, 15 second blurb as to why did Paul write to the church in Galatia? What's happening there? Right, so they were listening. Uh, so as Nancy said, they were listening to people with a false gospel, which really is no gospel at all. So the false gospel would, would, uh, would really be what? You're relying on your law keeping, narrowly defined the Mosaic law, though there are implications for the law in general. So you're relying on your law keeping in full or part to determine your standing before God. So Paul is still kind of, that's pretty much the entire issue that he deals with in Galatians. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, he kind of started out asserting his apostolic authority and how the Jerusalem teachers are in line with, with, um, with his gospel, which kind of lets us know that they, um, in many ways, were claiming they were, what they were doing was in line with the Jerusalem church. And, um, and I bet you in the Jerusalem church there probably were some Judaizers. I mean, the Jerusalem church is primarily made up of all Jews who believed in Jesus as the Messiah. And it's really hard to kind of give up some of the stuff that you grew up with that was very important. Okay? Um, and then in chapter 3, Paul begins to lay out his argument, well, why they shouldn't forsake the gospel. And he starts with saying, well, you receive the Holy Spirit. And then he starts talking about God's promise given to Abraham. How that, in a sense, uh, it precedes the, the, uh, the, the law given to Moses. And so, you know, we need to understand the law in light of the promise to Abraham. And now he's going to kind of continue with that same sort of thinking, but he's going to include more instruction, okay? Um, so he's going, to, he's going to, in a sense, move a little beyond what telling them this or that and giving more reasons as to why, okay? And that's where we're, going to, that's where we're finding ourselves now. So let's turn to Galatians chapter 4, okay? And um, he's going to start out basically saying, be like me. And we'll, f we'll try to roll that, or at least unpeel that to say exactly what does he mean. So let's look at verse 12. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. Wow, context is king here. Okay, so in the Greek, the word become is actually the word that starts the sentence. Become, and it's an imperative verb. I think it's the first imperative that he uses in the book of Galatians. I mean, I go by memory, so I could be wrong, but I'm thinking that's the case here. Okay, and then he, and then he calls them brothers, which is, which is kind of evocative use here. Um, you know, to, it's helping emphasize the command become. And then he says, you know, and then he uses the word entreat. So all of these things all emphasize the structure and his, the imperative verb that he uses, that Paul is serious. He wants them to be like him. Now that's kind of odd because why doesn't he say be like Christ? What does he say be like me? Well, who was Paul? I mean, if we don't know the context, we won't get this. But the Galatians know him, right? 
He went there earlier. He helped establish the congregation. So he can say lots of stuff, and he doesn't have to fill in a lot of the background. So be like me. So who was, okay, who was Paul when he was Saul? He was Jesus. Yeah, he was, he was a Jew's Jew. Soup, you know, works righteousness, you know, following the law fastidiously, being, trying to be the best that he could in, in the current day understanding of Judaism. Okay, um, Paul went to rabbi school. Uh, he studied under Gamaliel, who was, I think he was the uh, grandson of Hillel. Okay, and so he, he's like super serious. And then, of course, Paul becomes a Christian and he primarily focuses on if you want to look at the apostles, Peter primarily focuses on ministry to the Jews. Paul primarily focuses on ministry to the Gentiles. Now, the modus operandi for Paul, uh, would, when he goes to a new place, he, he would go to the synagogue, and invariably they would kick him out. You know, we don't want to hear your nonsense about Jesus being the Messiah. Go away. And, uh, and he focuses on, on the Gentiles. So it's not that he forsakes the Jewish people, okay? But in his understanding of the law as to what it does and does not do, he's no longer keeping the law to be righteous before God. The reason why Paul is righteous before God is because of Christ not because of his law keeping. If it's because of anybody's law keeping, it's because of Christ's law keeping for Paul, for all of us, okay? So in that regard, Paul has kind of forsaken his Judaic way of thinking of, oh man, you know, uh, at least as it existed back then, oh, you know, the law is very important and you got to be circumcised if you're going to be a real Christian. And where all of these bits were kind of, uh, kind of rolled into Christianity in a weird way. See, so Paul has kind of said, no, 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 no. That's not the way it goes. So if you were like a super fastidious Jew, you would look at Paul and you go, why are you acting like a Gentile? Why are you eating pork? Why do you say circumcision is no big deal anymore? Right? So, the, so the, the, the Jew looking at Paul would say, you're being a Gentile. That's important because when he says, become as I am, he's speaking to Gentiles who recently started doing what? Who started acting like Jews, right? So these agitators, these Judaizing false teachers, you know, they, they become part of the congregation and they're saying, oh, well, you know, I was raised a Jew. I really understand the Old Testament. You know, you're just Johnny come lately. What do you know? So they kind of snookered these people and, you know, here you do this and you have to do that. And so, in a sense, he's saying, become as I am. Why? Because I became as you were. In other words... I became like a Gentile. So, but for some strange reason, you're now becoming like fake Jews. Go back to being a Gentile. In other words, not relying on the law for your status before God. That's, that's what he's saying. And without the context, none of this makes sense because you're, because I am like, right? So that's what he's doing. And he implores them twice. This is on page one. Become as I am, for I also have become as you are. So and I, we just kind of mentioned that for the sake of the gospel. Paul became like a Gentile because of Christ, uh, because of Christ's faithfulness who fulfilled the purpose of the Torah for us. See, so that's the reason why in our following of the law, it's not to be made right before God. That's all Christ, Okay. Um, so, and Paul still could choose to eat kosher food, etc., if he want. But Paul also mentions, you did me no wrong. The reciprocal to him, to do, no, to do him no wrong is what? To listen to his gospel teaching, right? Because at least theologically, 
to reject Paul is to reject the gospel he brings. Okay, and so he kind of he kind of links that together, which which he did kind of in chapter one. We kind of see this linkage that he made. Okay, so now Paul's going to mention stuff, and if we lived in Galatia in the first century, we would know exactly what he's referring to, but we didn't, and so a lot of some of this stuff is a mystery. Okay, so let's look at verses thirteen and fourteen. Okay, you know. It was because of a bodily ailment. Okay, we'll look at that in a moment. That I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel. Okay, remember, what does the word angel mean? Messenger. And that's how Paul is using this. Not, you know, not like Isaiah 6 with a, right? The six-winged seraphs, that's not what, what um, Paul's talking about here. Okay, you receive me as an angel, a messenger of God, as Christ Jesus. Ah, okay. So it's not all about Paul. The only reason why Paul matters is because he's God's messenger who brings Christ Jesus. Okay, so he's referring to something, right? So the word for ailment, he uses the word flesh in the Greek, and then he uses the word ailment, okay? Osthesnea, okay? Which is, a, which is a fleshly ailment. So he's being a little redundant because he doesn't have to say flesh. So he says flesh, fleshly ailment. Um, but okay, so he's referring to some physical condition that he has, okay? that's real. Now, he doesn't say exactly what that is, okay? But he, he's going to contrast how they treated him before to what's happening now. So because of a, of a physical ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first, though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, okay? So, we don't know what this physical ailment is. I'm going to think that it's his eyesight, okay? Um, now, why would I say that? There isn't any direct clue, but he's going to mention um, their eyes in the next verse in Galatians 4, and then earlier in Galatians when he talked about who bewitched you, that literally was who evil-eyed you, so he's using kind of these eyeball references. Um, and so I think he's using these eyeball references to good rhetorical effect because he has eyesight problems. And I don't, you know, at one time I was thinking, oh, I'm wondering if it was from his conversion experience in the bright light. Or maybe, you know, he was, um, he was stoned to death, almost stoned to death a couple of times and he was beat up. And so he's had a lot of physical harm done to him. So there could be some disfigurement, okay? Um, but we don't know, but it was something where what? They could have scorned and despised him, right? Because whatever was going on with him made, made people uncomfortable. And it seems as if maybe he wasn't thinking of stopping at Galatia at the moment, but he was nearby and this physical problem was worse. So, oh, well, I need, I need to stop and just kind of, right? And so he's there and he's preaching the gospel and they received him as if whatever his ailment, his physical fleshly problem was, as if it was no problem at all to them. <coughs> See, so, um, and... Anyway, so I'm thinking it has something to do with the eyesight possible disfigurement, okay? Because let's look at, let's, let's move on and let's look at verses 15 and 16, see? What then has become of the blessing you felt? Okay, oh, okay. Um, For I testify you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me, right? He's being hyperbolic, right? But he's saying that the love that they showed him, right, 
that he's being hyperbolic, but he's saying it was so strong that you would have, you would have given me your own eyes if it would have helped. See? That's what makes me think that he had an eye issue. Right? And so he's kind of going back, of course, you know, can't do that and whatnot, but, but he uses that as, as kind of a touchstone to say how they expressed their love toward him and didn't reject him. So, you know, it was wow. Okay? Um, and, and yeah, this is de definitely hyperbole, but the point is made. Okay? How then have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? Now, what's weird is he's kind of asking a question, but he starts it with, with a word, a conjunction that normally is a concluding statement. So he's doing something kind of weird, which would, you know, which would be, um, so anyway, hoste in the Greek. So it would be like, so that. Okay. So yeah, he's asking a question, but really, it's a rhetorical question, but the answer is being doubly. Um, what the answer should be is really being pushed stronger than it would in just a normal rhetorical question. Okay, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? Well, he's saying I'm not your enemy, though based on the teachings that they received after Paul left, how do they view Paul? Oh, well, Paul came here and he introduced us to Jesus, but we didn't know he was so messed up. Wow. Because, well, Jesus was Jewish. So it makes sense that, you know, there's Jewish things that we should be doing and believing. Especially when Jews kind of come in and say, oh, we, yeah, we know the Old Testament. You don't really know the Old Testament. What do you know? You didn't grow up Jewish. Right? So, so they had this kind of, I'm better than you trump card that they can throw down on the table. What can you do if you were raised as a Gentile? Oh, okay, right? I mean, it's hard to kind of answer that when you do kind of recognize, oh, I didn't grow up memorizing the scriptures. So, you know, there you have it. So, have I then become your enemy? He's saying, I'm not your enemy. I'm telling you the truth. Yet, why do you see me that way? Okay. Um, and he's, so he's saying, so what kind of happened to the blessing? Yeah. The blessing is what? How well they treated him. Which also, you know, there's more to it. Their understanding of the gospel, which he preached to them. Their acceptance of the gospel. I mean, all of this kind of came together in a good way. And now, what happened? Right? I mean, this is one of those where you go like, what happened? You know, I was away for a little bit of time and, psh, right? Okay, so, verse 17. Are we ready? Okay. Jim is saying, oh yeah. Okay. They, who's they? Yeah, if we could figure out who they are, we would solve half the world's problem. Well, they, these are these agitating Judaizers, these works righteousness folks who, are, who, are, who have entered the congregation and have basically sullied the gospel. Th those are the they. They make much of you. Okay. Uh, He's going to use this phrase twice, so it may not make 100% sense, but it's good that the ESV tries to keep that connection. So they make much of you in a sense. They're complimenting you. They're currying your favor, right? They're, they're uh, pumping you full of sunshine, if you want to use that in a negative sense. In a sen and he is using make much of you here negatively. He'll use it in another verse in a moment positively, okay? Um, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. Why is it no good purpose? Because it's law-based. Okay? Not gospel-based. Or, Paul's not really using the word gospel. 
he's using the word promise in this case. Okay, going back to Abraham, God made a promise to Abraham. But the promise was what? Through an offspring of yours, the entire world will be blessed. But I'm an old man. And my wife's old. We can't have kids. Okay. So for no good purpose. They want to shut you out. The word shut you out or shut is really isolate. This is... Paul is referring to a break in fellowship. If this really becomes your, your position and you guys don't repent, there won't be fellowship between us. Paul is really saying you're going to be outside of the Christian church. Though you're going to think you are a Christian, you're still going to refer to Jesus as the Savior, you're still going to believe in Him, but you're going to rely on yourself in full or in part for your status before God. That's not Christianity. That's something else, even if it has the trappings of Christianity. Okay? And so this is like, whoa, man, Paul is saying, we're going to, you know, there's going to be a break in fellowship over this. That's how serious this is. Why? Because we think you ought to, right? So, as Paul operates, it's all or nothing. You're saved by grace, by God's doing, by Christ's faithfulness, right? Or you're not. Okay? They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. Okay, so I, I guess that, that's kind of negative too. See? So I, I misspoke when I said... Um, so yeah, you can kind of see, so that way, why? So that way you're on their side, and you look up to them, and you speak well of them, but they're false teachers. They're, they're, they're using stuff that sounds like real Christianity, but in their words and in their teachings is poison. Right? Oh, but it's only 0.1% poison. How bad is the poison? Right. Will that 0.1% kill you spiritually? See? So Paul is saying, hey, you know, you, you, you can't abide with this. Okay? So this is, this is very kind of ser serious. So that makes sense why the word become, where he started out in verse 12, was an imperative. You know, become like a Gentile, meaning no works righteousness. That's really what he's saying, not that you're going to be a pagan, chasing after pagan gods, right? So we need to understand. But that's, but he's saying you have to reject all this works righteous stuff. It's bad for you, okay? All right, 18 through 20, okay. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. Okay, there we go. There's, there, there's the positive use of it. Okay, it is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. Meaning what? So you're, 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 you're getting filled with sunshine, but in a good way. This is getting your esteem from Christ. You're valuable to God. Why? Well, because Christ lived and died for me. Okay. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, for the gospel, not law-keeping. And not only when I am present with you. See, remember he's saying, okay, um, you know, hey, this is going to be a breach in fellowship, but if you're following, if you're trusting in Christ and relying on his faithfulness and not on what you do, then we're in fellowship even when I'm not with you. See, so the fellowship is based on not physically being with someone, but believing the same thing, which is really trusting in Christ for our salvation. Okay. Um, and then let's let's um, press on to nineteen and twenty. My children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. We'll, we'll unfold that. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. So, see, 
we kind of get this. Paul doesn't understand this. But see, he was super Jew, right? And as far as he knew, he did everything right, and he was keeping the law, and he was doing everything. And yet, when you're always honest with yourself, you're like, well, you know, I'm doing the best I can, but I'm really not perfect, okay? So for him, the gospel freedom is like, whoa! You know, when the gospel, when the gospel finally hit him and everything fell into place, he's like, how could I ever go back? How could I ever go back to, to the slavery of my status with God is dependent on what I do? He said, you have to be a crazy man to want to go back. I mean, so, you know, the liberation he has in Christ is just in his marrow and in his bones. And he's, how could you guys, see, which, which, um, so they didn't have the existential crisis that Paul had. So it's easier to kind of add to the gospel, add law to the gospel and mix it together. See, so Paul kind of understands if it's one little smidgen of law, pfft, why do you even have gospel at all? Okay? So let's take a look at my children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Okay, okay. So he's, in a sense, this is allegorical, isn't it? Because he's not really a mother who could go into anguish of childbirth, right? Even today, all those weird trans dudes, they can't actually have babies, you know, even though you could take hormones and everything else and look like a woman, you can't, you don't have a womb, okay? So this is, this is metaphorical, okay? But, so he's metaphorically describing his role is like that of a birth mother, undergoing labor to deliver a child. See, he's, he's what? I mean, often he will use the imagery of being a father, but here he's using the imagery of being a mother, It'll make sense when we get to the next metaphorical usage that he uses as an example. Okay, But notice, though he's in anguish and he describes himself as a woman in labor, he doesn't say, until I bring forth Christ in you. Which is kind of the normal thing that you would expect in childhood. Oh, well, she's in labor and she's in the anguish of labor until she gives birth to, to the child. right? But Paul says what? You know, until Christ is formed in you. Ooh, passive voice. Okay, so even though he's in anguish and he's saying, I'm like, a, I'm like a mother in anguish waiting for the birth of the child, it's God's doing. See, so even he as God's apostle to them, the results are not up to him. If it was, even though sometimes he may talk that way, but if it was, right, then it's law based on what he does. See? So you, you notice how he keeps always, always pushing the Galatians from anything where they could try to claim credit. And so this is, so he's very careful in his wording, okay? Well, he expressed the same kind of idea elsewhere. And, um, and, and some of these other examples that I bring up, really, we looked at a previous lesson where Paul was talking about baptism and living in your baptism. And so this is kind of the same, really, it's kind of um, very similar, even though he's not specifically referring to baptism. Though baptism is a spiritual birth, Okay, so it's not, he doesn't use the word baptism, but it's in there, especially since he talked about baptism in chapter 3. Okay, and here he's talking about childbirth, which is Christ doing. Okay, so what, what is the idea that Paul's talking about? Our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. 
Page three, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Okay, and from Romans, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So this is also baptismal language. Okay, um, so when you could say, oh, he's telling them to return to their baptism. He's telling them to repent of this false teaching. Okay? And yet, at the end of the day, who does this? Right? Until Christ is formed in you. Passive voice. Okay? So, yeah. You can't claim credit for your repenting. You can't claim credit for returning to your baptism. I can't. You can, but then what are you going to do? You're going to see it as your work. And it's not your work. It's God's work for you, in you, so on and so forth. Okay? Um, so that's kind of how he ends here. Now he's going, to, he's going to bring out an example using two different mothers from the Old Testament in Genesis. Now the thing is, he says that this is allegorical. He says this is a metaphorical understanding because when you see how he assembles the pieces, you're going to go, w w wait a minute. These people weren't out Mount, Mount Sinai. Or, you know, so th there are pieces where he's expecting you to fill in the blanks. Okay? But he wants to make a contrast between two covenants. And one is really the malformed understanding of works righteousness, and the other is the new covenant Christ put in place, okay, fulfilling the old, okay. So let's let's uh, let's turn. We're going to turn to verse twenty-one, okay, and let's look at verses twenty-one and twenty-two. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Okay, which it seems like many in the congregation at Galatia want to be under the law because they bought into the idea that, oh, my status before God depends on law keeping, whatever that law is. We know it deals with circumcision and there are probably other rituals of Mosaic law because he talked about calendars and that sort of thing. So, um, but we don't know the full extent of which laws of the Mosaic law they were expected to keep. I mean, the, in a sense, that would kind of make you scratch your head if you're on the receiving end. You go, well, why do I have to follow this law but not that one? I mean, it, it kind of, when you kind of think about the Old Testament, right, we kind of have a tendency when we look at the law, we go, oh, well, there's a ceremonial law, which we don't follow because it has to do with Judaism and all of the specific practices of, of that, right? But we go, oh, but the moral law, right? Which transcend the specifics of Judaism, oh, right? And so we would place the Ten Commandments in that category. But even the Sabbath day is a ceremonial law. Not the idea behind it, because the Sabbath day was a day of rest right? In the Old Covenant. Now, the, the, re, the truth behind that is, yeah, you know, so you need to have a time where you rest and receive God's work for you, okay? That still holds, but that it has to be Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, we would say, oh, well, no, that's part of the, right? So, um, so even, even the 10 words have some kind of a ritualistic aspect to it that we would say doesn't apply. But you would, have, you would still have to ask why. So why am I supposed to give 10% tithing when I don't have to ritually wash my hands before eating? Right? I mean, isn't there kind of this willy-nilly even today? And so, well, I know why you're supposed to give 10%. So the church doesn't go bankrupt. I mean, you know, but so you don't, you don't take something out of context and apply it in the new covenant willy-nilly like that. The truth behind the tithe was what? Oh, well, the, the Old Testament priests, Old Covenant priests, 
they couldn't work, they couldn't own land, and so the tithe was really to pay for them so they could be priests. Oh, the truth behind that still makes sense. Okay, in the new covenant, we want to pay our pastors so they can be pastors. Okay, but the 10% itself, just like the Sabbath day itself. See? So you need to understand what's the thinking behind the letter of the law. What's the spirit of the law? Okay, um, not just, oh, right? Um, and so the, the, the Christians in Galatia are really kind of doing a legalistic letter of the law thing based on what these Judaizers are telling them. Okay? So verses 21 and 22. Okay? I have to turn the page. Tell me, who, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Implication what? Well, if you really listen to the law... You're going to go, well, this is actually worse, right? Wow, because I, I am kind of messing up. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Okay, who knows this story? It's in Genesis, right? And why would there be a son from a slave woman anyway? Yes, Sarah. So, so Deb was saying that Sarah was barren. True. Now, God promised that Abraham and Sarah would have children, or a child, through whom all the world would be blessed. Well, when the promise was made, it was like, well, uh, if God could pull this off, oh, that'd be pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was... Wow, you know, I mean, this was the days before Viagra. This was the day before fertility pills, <sighs> right? So clearly, based on what Abraham says, Sarah has gone through menopause. I mean, women went through menopause in those days too, right? So it was like, <sighs> so in other words, if they're going to have a child, how will it come about? Yes, it, it, yes. So Joyce said the child will come about through God. Yes. Right? Because, wow, they're both old. And so it's going to have to be a miracle that God is going to overcome their physical inability to have children. Okay? Now, um, before they actually... I'll tell you, this is my opinion, okay, because I can't, my opinion is this, and, I, and I'll say, because Sarah couldn't have a child, she was in menopause, but Abraham still could, see, and how do we know? Well, because 14 years before Isaac is born, Sarah goes, well, maybe God really meant that we would have a child through my servant. See, kind of, that, kind of that connection, that understanding of household, and she's, she's uh, Sarah's uh, house servant, and, and her name was Hagar, all right? So Abraham sleeps with Hagar through Sarah's encouragement. Bad idea, wives, to tell your husband to sleep with another woman. Bad idea, okay? Because if the wife gives permission, what's the husband going to do? Really? You really want me to? Okay. Right? So, um, and so Ishmael is born. And so while Ishmael, while Hagar has Ishmael, consider the internal politics of the household. Sarah's the wife, but who's really holding the cards? Hagar is, because she bore Abraham a son. She may be the servant, but in... In actual, who has the power? She does, because she's the mother. And Sarah becomes furious and jealous. And oh man, you talk about the, some of the arguments that they have when it's recorded in Scripture, like, whew, man. Um, and then, of course, they do conceive. 
But my opinion is, is that God was going to wait till Abraham no longer could father a child. It doesn't say this, but this is my thinking. That way there is no doubt it's God's doing. See, so by human doing, Abraham was the father of Ishmael through Hagar. Well, 14 years later, right? And so a year before Isaac's born, right? You have, you have the, uh, the account of, of <clears throat> you know, the angels visiting and Sarah's laughing. <laughs> and she's, yeah, and it's basically, and I think she says a comment also about Abraham. Basically saying, Abraham can't even do the deal now. So, um, and so, th so this is my putting together of, of the bits. So God was going to wait until there was no doubt it was his miracle child. Oh, genetically, it'll be Abraham and Sarah's baby. But it only happened because of God's doing and working. And so that's the story, and that's what Paul's going to tap into now. Okay, except he's going to do this in a really wonky way. So, and we have to understand the, the basic premise of this is that Ishmael was born by the work of the flesh, meaning it was really done by Abraham and Hagar in unbelief or misdirected belief if you want to go there. Well, you know... And so they're really not trusting in God, and so they're coming up with their solution, okay? Um, and so, yeah. And of, of course, Isaac is not according to the flesh because the flesh wasn't working. Abraham and Sarah's flesh couldn't have a baby, and yet she bore, okay? Okay? And so he's going to use those two realities to kind of compare covenants. And that's why he says this is a metaphorical or allegorical uh, uh, understanding. So let's turn to page three. Okay, so Abraham, son of the slave woman Ishmael, from verse, chapter four, verse 22. Born of the flesh. What does this mean? Well, Hagar gave birth as a result of a human work which took place because of a lack of faith in God's promise. Now, God needs our help. Sure, Jesus saved us, but without my extra works. There you go. Okay, born of the flesh. This signifies human effort trying to do what only God can do. What about Abraham's son of the free woman? Free wife, because she wasn't the servant. See, so he's kind of using freedom and slavery by using these two women, okay? Isaac, born of the promise. Sarah gave birth as a result of God's fulfilling, should be God fulfilling his promise. This signifies Christ's faithfulness fulfilling the law believed by faith. So these are Abraham's and Sarah's true heirs. If you're born of the promise, you're, right? They're true heirs. Born under the law. See, this is where the allegory falls apart, but you need to stick with kind of what he's doing. So he's using Mount Sinai. God gave the law to Israel at Mount Sinai. Yet Hagar, right? She wasn't there. Go with the flow here, okay? So born under the law, Mount Sinai represents those whose righteousness depends on law keeping. See, well, really, God needs our help. Law keeping, okay? Born under Mount Zion, this mountain is not named. It's not stated, but it's implied. Represents those whose righteousness depends on the one promised keeping of the law. See, so, okay, so the one, right, who will be a descendant of Isaac, okay, who will keep the law, okay? And then how, how does, and then he describes those born kind of under this slavery or who live under this works righteousness slavery, it's Mount Sinai, right? Trying to fulfill the Mosaic law by what you do. He calls, he calls them residents of the current earthly Jerusalem, okay? Which is the center of Judaism, okay? So the Judaizers who are in spiritual slavery, that's what it represents, 
because they must fulfill the law. That's the Judaizers' thinking. Yeah, Jesus saved you, but you still have to. So in other words, unless you do whatever Jesus did, doesn't matter. Okay? Those born of the promise are citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem above. Now this even kind of gets wonkier. Because the heavenly Jerusalem above, oh, well, that's after we die. That's after the resurrection of the dead. Right? But what's the point being made there? Who is in the heavenly Jerusalem above? No one's there by their law-keeping, but by Christ's law-keeping for them. In other words, the promise, not the law. We would say gospel, but... He, but Paul is sticking with the promise language, which is the promise that God will do what's necessary, just like God did what was necessary for Abraham and Sarah to have a child. Okay? So if you're children of the promise, you're relying on God doing what's necessary. If you're a child of Hagar, you're a child of the law, taking things into your own hands and saying, ah, my eternal outcome or... You know, the outcome depends on what I do in some way. And that's really how he runs with, runs with these two, allegorically uses these two covenants by looking at Ishmael and Isaac and Hagar and Sarah. Okay? So, um, so the promise-based covenant is like, whew, wow. It's not because of me. It's because of the promise which is fulfilled by Christ. The law-based covenant, well, it depends on me in some way, which means that in some way becomes everything. Because if you don't do that little part, you're in some way, then everything falls apart and nothing matters. Okay? Well, there is a chiastic structure. Let's turn to page four and we will kind of see how, how this works and what's kind of the main point. Remember the chiasm as you state certain points and then you reverse the order and the main, main emphasis is on in the middle. Okay? So we can kind of see that uh, in verses 25 through 26 in chapter 4, Paul starts out mentioning Hagar. He finishes with our mother. Our mother is Sarah. Yeah. Okay. And there's also a, uh, there's also a little bit of one of the Psalms being used. So we would say, in this case, Sarah also represents the church, but we're not going to go there for now. Okay? Mount Sinai, where God gave the law, implied, not mentioned, but it doesn't make sense if you don't kind of understand that Paul is also contrasting Mount Sinai with Mount Zion. Okay? That would be B prime. Well, of course, slavery. Your status before God depends on what you do. If you're going to have the child you got to do something. And Abraham sleeps with Hagar. Okay? Um, but the promise is freedom because it's not dependent on your doing. And in fact, what was dependent on their doing messed it up. Right? Abraham and Sarah, their doing messed it up and produced Ishmael. Right? But God's doing through them Right? Produced Isaac. And so those who are enslaved under the idea of Hagar and law keeping, well, they live in the present earthly Jerusalem. In other words, that's the thinking of the Judaizers who have what? Infiltrated the church at Galatia. But the heavenly Jerusalem above, oh, that's different. That's based on the promise. That's based, and the promise is on the one who will bless the world, the one who will fulfill the law for us, the one who will be our righteousness. All of this points to Christ, right? And only those who are relying on Christ as their righteousness belong to the heavenly Jerusalem above, right? And, and Paul will make that point a little and more emphatic in the next couple of verses. So the, the idea is, to which Jerusalem do you belong? See, this is what the chiasm is, is kind of saying to the people in Galatia. They understand these kind of, uh, these uses of rhetoric. OK? 
Okay, and so to which do you belong? The law-based one which enslaves or the promise-based one which frees? See? So the structure itself is kind of emphasizing that, kind of throwing, throwing that question at their feet. Okay? And so Paul is now going to quote from Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1, verbatim from the Septuagint. Okay? And so the context of that is, okay, so... Isaiah, when you look back, he's writing, at least 54, he's writing to a people who are in exile. And they're what? Well, we're in exile, but we want to go home. We're hoping that we will go home. And that's kind of the context, right? To an exiled people, okay? And so let's, let's turn to Galatians 4.27, where we'll hear him quote Isaiah 54.1 from the Septuagint. Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud. So Isaiah is being metaphorical. He's he's kind of using this imagery of Israel being a barren woman. Right? So that's kind of the picture of being in exile. Right? O barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud. Who are you who are not in labor? So. You're God's people, but you're in exile, and things aren't as they should be. For the children of the desolate one, the barren woman. Okay? So you can understand this like, oh, Israel, but the context of Galatians, oh, Sarah, she was barren. So you can see why he's quoting this verse. Sarah was barren. She was the desolate one. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Huh? Original promise. Genesis 12. Through you, meaning Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. It's going back to the promise. Right? So in other words... The children of the desolate one is not genetically who's descended, right? But what? Who are, who belong to the family by faith. Does that make sense? Okay. So he, so yeah, he, it's like, what does this have to do with me? Yeah. So it's pretty clever what he does here. Okay. So I would hate to have, Paul, I bet you if Paul took an IQ test, he'd be 150 or something, you know. But um, anyway, supposedly we're, we're getting dumber. I mean, our IQ tests keep, are lowering over, anyway, never mind. That's a different topic. It could just be that maybe the way that they measure it, we're not as good in the way that they measure it, so it could be our reading and whatever ability. But Okay, so let's figure out, well, what are the implications of this allegory that he uses? Right, with Hagar and Sarah and law keeping and promise and who, who, whoever's keeping the promise. Verses 28 through 31. Okay? Now then, brothers, like Isaac, oh, now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Okay? So what? <laughs> this is who you are. Why are you forsaking it? But just as at the time he who was born to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So you have to go back to Genesis. Persecuting is a little strong because it's really, um, you go back to what takes place in Genesis, it's really more that Ishmael's making fun of Isaac. You know, brothers and making fun of him. Maybe picking on him a little bit, but not persecuting. But he's still being a little allegorical, even though he's being a lot more literal here. Okay? Uh, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. Why did he say persecuted? Because those who are works righteous don't like the gospel, at least 100%. So 100% God's doing. But, and see the people who add the but don't like the people who don't add the but. Okay? Because for them, if you don't do the but, the rest of it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of whatever that is. Okay? So you can turn believing into a work, which Paul doesn't want the Galatians to do. 
So, but you can turn that into your work and then you can go, oh yeah, Christ, I'm here, but... See? You're, you're going to turn believing into a work which Scripture elsewhere says is a gift. Okay? Um, so, according to the Spirit, so also it is now. So he's, using, he's still using that, but applying it to his current day. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So what's all of this about? Well, Sarah becomes jealous and begins to despise Hagar. And after Isaac is born, she's like, kick him out. We have a son. Get rid of him. Because, well... What if they want to kill Isaac? Right? Because now Hagar, she's not the queen bee anymore, though she's the servant. Right? So the tables have turned. And God affirms what Sarah tells Abraham to do. Yes, they need to go. So Sarah, in her woman's intuition, probably undersaw some stuff that Abraham didn't. And God was like, yeah, because otherwise Isaac needs to grow up. Okay, so that's, that, that is what ends up happening. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. He's calling the Galatians back. This is who you are. You know, and so he's saying, do you want to belong to the slave covenant? So you can see there's a number of things. He's, he's saying, why would anybody do that? And now he's actually saying, that's not who you are. And he's right, that's not who you are in Christ. Because that's who you are based on the law, or who you are in yourself, or whatever it is, but not in Christ. Okay, and that's, that's where, where he ends here. Okay, so we can kind of look at the bottom of page four. Ishmael, born according to the flesh, symbolizing the works of the Judaizers persecutes that as opposes his brother who represents salvation by Christ, trusting in him. Children of slavery. Isaac, born according to the Spirit, which is what? Meaning the promise. Okay? Symbolizing Christ's faithfulness. Child of the promise who suffers persecution, representing those with the works righteousness bent to oppose salvation by grace. That's not weird. Okay? Um, does inherit like Isaac did. If you're going to inherit something, it's not based on what you do. It's based on belonging to the right family. Right? I am like a woman in childbirth. Right? And then, of course, children of freedom, not slavery. So in response to Judaizing agitators, Paul allegorizes the Hagar-Sarah story, which serves to affirm and support those in Galatia who trust in Christ's faithfulness for them. Okay? And rejecting the message of the ad- agitators as the falsehood it is. Next week, he'll start, we'll start, not next week, Two weeks from now, because next week, uh, Pastor Burge will be here uh, filling in for me. Um, And so we'll reconnect on chapter 5 where he's basically going to say, stand firm in the gospel, not in slavery. All right, thoughts, questions? Or am I just going to stand here and do these weird kung fu moves? Okay. Uh, In our sermon today, we're going to hear about Abraham but it's going to be Abraham in his faithfulness, not in his unfaithfulness and sleeping with Hagar. So, um, so we're getting a double dose of Abraham. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we are children of the promise and that our status with you depends on what Christ does, whom you promised long ago uh, to Abraham. May our trust in him never waver because, well, why would we want to trust in anything else which will only fail and falter? Hold us and keep us strong in the faith through your spirit all our days. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen.